Hey, Larry McRae, great to meet you. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's taken us quite a while to get here, huh? Yes, ma'am, it did. I'm sorry about that. No, no, it's all good. It's terrific to make your acquaintance. I just love your music. And this latest album is a real tribute to you. Um, how are you doing these days? You've been busy as anything. Yeah, it seems like things are heating up a little bit for me. I'm getting a little busy. They wait till, till I got old till they want to make me get busy. <laughs> <laughs> it's often the way, isn't it? You know, I've been trying to come to Australia for about 30 years, and I've been booked there a couple of times, and every time I get a book in there, something comes to cancel it before the date arrives, so I never got a chance to make it. Oh, well, there's still plenty of time. Have you got a Have you got a booking in the pipeline still? I don't know. I don't, I don't <laughs> know, you know whether or not, you know, okay. any possibilities are going on now, but I'm, I'm hoping so. Yeah, well, we'd love to see you here. I'm sure it won't be too long at all. Larry, take me back to where it all started for you. How did you get going with that guitar? Well, um, I was raised in rural Arkansas. I was born in 1960. And in the town where that I was raised up at, it was only about 600 people, six to 700 people in the whole community. So, I mean, you know, it was a very small school, very subdued. Uh, my older sister is the one who inspired me to play. And she was passed the instrument from our grandmother. My grandmother played guitar. My father played a little guitar, but he was a harmonica expert, a singer, dancer. And then, you know, my sister got it. She passed it to me. My younger brother's a drummer. I have one brother that's a bass player, and I had two brothers that blew horns. So... I think that um, out of the fact that we were so rural and just nothing to do, the only thing we had to hold on to was music. Right. Well, music certainly ran in everybody's veins across all those generations, right? Yes, ma'am. And and it wasn't um, it wasn't that we were trained or skilled with music. We just wanted music in our life, and we just picked up and tried to learn to play our own music. So does that mean with with the in a tiny little community with nothing much to do, you'd sit around most nights making music? Well, not in the, not in the earlier days. Once I got to be a teenager, I left Arkansas in seventy two when I was twelve years old, and I moved to Michigan with my older sister, who had already left in the sixties. She left from down there, and so she was um seventeen years old anyway. My big sister was like a second mother. So, you know, I, I left from South and went to live with my big sis in Michigan, and she was already playing music. She had bands before she left Arkansas. So really the first time I got a chance to play an instrument was when I came to Michigan. Prior to that, all I knew was work. What sort of work were you doing? Even as a, as a kid, you were working? Oh, for sure, for sure. F mostly farm work, you know, hoeing the hoeing and, you know, working in fields and stuff like that, you know. When I was six years old, I had a job with a, a neighbor working in a small uh, engine garage. You know, I was just a fetch a kid, bring me this, get me that. You know, I was the third hand, you know. Yeah, right. Well, well what about schooling? Oh, I, I had proper schooling. But, I mean, you know, like I say, you know, it, it was just a thing that everybody worked. Everybody contributed to uh, try to make it better for all. What do you think of that practice? I think it was a very good practice because it taught me a lot of values that, you know, I see that people today don't have as they grow up. You know, I feel very special about the way that I was brought up because it teaches you respect. It teaches you the value of a dollar and it teaches you a good work ethic. And the fact that you're not afraid to bend your back or not afraid to work. Nowadays, most people are afraid to work. Everybody say work harder, uh, work yeah. smarter and not harder, which is a good practice. But if nobody works at all, then who gets the work done? <laughs> and that's part of why, do you know, the world and the situations are the way it is. Nobody wants to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The world certainly changed a lot, hasn't it, since you were a little oh. kid? Yes, ma'am, it did. 
I'm yeah. a dinosaur and I know it. <laughs> hey, that makes me one too. <laughs> well, that's okay. Yeah. We got a lot of wisdom from the years. That's right. That's right. Some things you have to be proud of, and I'm proud of my upbringing. Ain't nothing for me to be ashamed of. Of course not. Has your music, your your, your musicianship improved over the years with age? I think that I got um, a little more seasoned, and I think that, you know, my music is, is more tasteful. I don't think my technique or anything improved so much over the years, but you know, that's the result of not having a situation to take you to higher learning. So, you know, the more accomplished you become on your own, that's the fewer and fewer things you become, you 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 learn as you become better. You know, when, when you first start out, everything is new. Everything that you learn, every tidbit is something new. But when you become accomplished to a certain level, it is hard to take it beyond that if you don't have somebody that's better than you to pull you up to the next level yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense but then you did have people to help you get to the next level didn't you along the way well not so much in my plan but you know a lot of people in terms of uh career wise and career moves and stuff like that so so you're saying that your playing has just developed at your own pace over the years without anybody kind of taking you under the wing and, and expanding you further? Yes, ma'am. Right. Um, well, you, you've done incredibly um, uh, self-taught and all on your own. It's, it's amazing. The the music you're making is astounding. You played with a whole lot of people, but uh, in the 80s, you were signed to Virgin Records subsidiary label, Point Black Records. You were the first artist that was um, that was signed on there, and your debut album, Ambition, which was very aptly titled, um, was recorded in, in the Detroit Basement Studio. Tell us about the making of that album. <laughs> well, those were definitely some, um, as I look back on it, I mean, you know, I was flying by the seat of my pants. I had uh, no experience. Other than, you know, I had been playing in clubs and stuff since I was uh, a young man, you know. And by the time I made Ambition, I was coming to the end of my 20s into my early 30s. And um, I started playing guitar when I was 12. So, you know, I had been playing for a while. But really, you know, I worked for General Motors. And I just dreamed of playing guitar, you know, on a on a larger level. I thought that the reality would never come true for me. Wow. So I was very excited to uh, have somebody interested in, in hearing my music and recording my music. And I made a lot of mistakes business-wise and stuff like that because of being eager. And it would cost me later. But at the time... I, I I just jumped in. It didn't make me no difference. I was hell bent and for sure what I wanted to do. And I just jumped in and didn't think about the consequences. Yeah. Well, I think that happens to all young people, doesn't it? <laughs> the, yes. the, the keenness overtakes the, the sense a lot of times. Right. So right, amb right. Amb ambition did really well for you. It was just <laughs> off and running right from, from the get-go uh, when it came out in 1990. It was acclaimed everywhere. What's your favourite track on that album? On the ambition track? Uh, let me see. Ambition. I like... Um, well... I like One More Lonely Night. And I like um, Secret Level. Okay, we'll have a listen to that. How do you go about writing your stuff? Well, my, my inspiration for writing, I try to get a subject matter first, and then I try to have a musical hook. So I have my music and parameters all set before I have lyrics. But once I have, uh, say, for instance, uh, <laughs> If I if I start there, I say uh, next thing is to get a subject, and then once I get a subject, all I do is fill in the blanks. I've been I've been fooling with something like called 
a wonderful day. And I'll just give you a little bit of it, something like. Every day when I ride and the sun is shining, shining in my eyes, what do you say? What a wonderful day. You know, something like that. Awesome. And then I would put a change like this. Very you cool. know, you know, you know now, now I got a subject, wonderful day. I just fill in the blanks and Right. Try to try to try to make it have rhythm and bounce to the music. So, did you just come up with that formula yourself, or did somebody say to you, "This is the way we write music, we write songs"? No, ma'am. That's the way. That's the way that you know. That's what works for me, because um, I'm I'm a stickler for arrangement, and I don't see how that you can you can you can take and and write about a subject. But then after you write about the subject, you're going to have to try to come up with music to fit those words. And I think it's much easier to do it the other way around, to come up with a musical structure and then engineer words that fit inside of that structure. Yeah. If that well, makes any sense. Yeah, it, it sure makes sense. And it's certainly working for you, isn't it? Because you've been highly awarded. You've been awarded everywhere. You were male blues guitarist of the year in 2000. You won the top guitarist prize in the International Blues Matters in 2014. Uh, and you were awarded the Sunshine Sunny Pain Award for Blues Excellent in 2015. You must have been not only really pleased to pick up those awards, but pretty shocked. I, I I was shocked. You know, the most shocking thing for me is that, um, you know, when when you're young, you aspire and you come out with full force and you dream big and you think the world is at your feet. Well, you know, I came out with all those dreams, but when I got involved and found out what the business side of music was all about, you know, it was a it was <laughs> a, a a rude awakening. For me, you know, I thought that before I got involved, that once you got to a label, that you and the label teamed up and the label looked out for you and this and that and the other. And I come to find out that it was just the opposite. You know, the label sits on the other side of the table for. Nope, hang on, I lost you. What happened? What happened here? I can't hear you anymore. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I can't hear you. Sorry, oh. the phone was ringing. Oh, okay, cool. So you were saying you, you thought the what happens is that the label sits on the opposite side of the table? Yes, ma'am. And instead of them being for you, they're, they're trying to rake all the, as much as they can get on their side of the table. It's up to you to represent yourself and try to get what you think is fair for yourself and I didn't really realize in the beginning that that's the way it was. Yeah pretty pretty disappointing thing to to figure out when you're in the midst of it. Is that why you started your own label? Yes and and uh, to have more creative control you know over what was and what wasn't. So yeah. you know that was another lesson learned that you know you can have your label all you want to but if you don't have the money to distribute it you still at a loss. You know what I'm saying? You you can do small things, but you're not going to do big things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Larry McRae, over the years, you've played with some incredible blues giants, people like B.B. King and Buddy Guy, yeah. Albert King, John Mayle, Robert Cray, Keb Moe, Kenny Wayne Shepherd, uh, the Allman Brothers, Johnny Lang, Joe Walsh, an amazing array of players. How did they all come along and, and how did that feel for you? Because these guys must have been your heroes that you grew up with. Oh, for sure. For sure. Well, once once I got a chance to uh, start doing some things and, and going to bigger stages, you know, after a while, after you get your feet a little wet, you uh, look around and kind of say, okay, well, this feels pretty good. Maybe I do belong here. 
or maybe not, but either way, it feels good to have the opportunity. So it's up to you to make the best of it. So I always try to, um, I try to carry myself with humility, but yet and still when I went to the stage, I always tried to be the best that I could be, you know? So with those two things in mind, that was always my guiding light, you know, right. be respectful, be humble, be the best you can be. Yeah. Sounds good. And it's I, a good way I, to I live. Serious, you know what I mean? Yeah. So when was it that you kind of finally decided, yeah, this is where I'm meant to be? When I got a chance to tour with Gary Moore and Albert Collins and Albert King, all on the same bill. And, um, you know, uh, when we first started out, it was um, Gary Moore, Kenzie Report, and Larry McCray Band. And we were the open up act, we were the, the support act. And in many places that we went to play, the reviews would always come out talking about the support act. We were getting the ink every night, you know? And um, it made me feel good. I mean, you know, I've always thought that I had a little bit of talent or that I was pretty good, but I also knew too, that if you couldn't get to the mass of the people that um, you you still hadn't, I, I still hadn't reached my goal. So I've never been able to get the um, masses behind me. And I think a lot of it had to do with management and stuff like that. And um, your management have to be able to get doors open opposed to having doors closed. And a lot of times, you know, I got a lot of doors closed on me because the people didn't like my representation. Yeah, right. I hear you. Um, Larry, which song do you enjoy performing best? Which these one days, do you like performing most? Well, these days on the on the new record, I really like to do Arkansas, the opening tune. I really like um, Without Love, What Does It Matter? But the thing with that song, Without Love, What Does It Matter? It took a musical twist during the recording, and it's kind of not the same song that it was when we originally did it. So when I do it live, I still do it my original way and not so much the way that it's done on the recording. Okay. It's more subtle, more subtle live. <laughs> Just like that, not with all the bang, 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 and the drum going crazy and all that. It was just a subtle song. Someday the mill just don't run. Some days the moon comes up just to spite the sun. Or cats call for sunny. But my shoes are already soaking wet. You know, so it was more subtle. Oh, well, was expectation. This is what you might get. You know, so it was really subtle. And I thought it had a, a, a good message to it. And playing out live, it gets a really good response, but we, we I think we're much more dynamic. And that's between me and you. I won't I tell anybody. <laughs> All right, good, 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 good. <laughs> Larry, what about, you mentioned Arkansas. That was a an homage to to the, the place that you live, to your birthplace? Yes, yes, yes. You know, um, a lot, I've, I've listened to the state of Arkansas get slammed all my life. You know, in the United States, that's one of those states where it is a uh, very poor state, suppressed and stuff like that. And uh, they got a lot of jokes about Arkansas people. But Arkansas people are some of the smartest people and innovative people that I've ever got a chance to experience being around. And so that's another one of the things when people uh, try to give you a stigma, you take it and use it against them or you use it for something turning into something positive. And mm -hmm. that was always uh, an inspiration for me. Yeah, Arkansas is a hard working 
hard grinding state. But also the people have a lot of gusto there. And when we party, we party and we know how to party right. And, you know, so what you had to do a little bit of work, that's just the celebration of what you do. Yeah. Do you ever go back there? I do. I do. And I, I bet you're welcomed with big open arms. Sorry? I'm sorry. I said, I, be, I bet you're welcomed with big open arms and a, and a, a hometown hero's um, response. Yes, ma'am. I have the key to the city, to the little town where, that, uh, where I was raised at. And they have a, a blossom fest. It's where they uh, cook all these steaks. They cook 6,000 steaks. They have one of the big steak cook-offs. And they have the Oscar Mayer wiener trucks. And they have eating contests. And they have all other kind of games and stuff going on. And that's in my little hometown of Magnolia. Uh, gorgeous. Hey, that's, that's so, so nice. We had a chance to go there just before the pandemic and play the festival. And that was really nice for me because I had been wanting to do that for a long time. And I finally got a chance to play my hometown festival. Yeah, really special. Um, yeah. I'm I'm chatting with blues legend Larry McRae. Um, Larry, how did you get to meet Joe Bonamassa? I met Mr. Bonamassa. Uh, I saw him the first time in the 90s. He was a teenager. And then I met him in Nashville when he was about 21 or two years old. And I was playing at BB uh, King's in Nashville. And he come in and stuck his head in the door. And Eric Gills was playing in the basement after us. So he went down to Eric after after we guys got finished. And the three of us got a chance to get together and have a chat right there. But I already knew Eric from uh, Memphis. I was in Memphis. Uh, like along between 92 and 96 when they first uh, renovated Bill Street. Uh -huh. So I met Eric Gales down there, a young man, right after his first CD release. And then, you know, I stayed in touch with him all through the years. So when I saw him, it was just old friends getting together. Uh, but that he... was the first time I ever got a chance to sit down and talk with Joe or hang out with him a little bit. Yeah. Eric Gales, quite an artist too, isn't he? Oh, they both are just off the charts. <laughs> so I mean, okay. So you 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 uh, you got together with Joe, and when did he tell you he wants to look after you and and uh, manage this new album? Well, um, after I, I've worked with um, a manager for about thirty four years, and when he passed away um, a year ago in April, was it a year ago or two years ago? When he passed a year ago. I had already uh, spoken with Joe. Some friends of mine, uh, I, I played a birthday party for a friend of mine in Auburn, Alabama. And he listens to Joe's uh, webcast and everything all the time. And he would tell me, he said, man, you ought to get a hold of Joe. Joe plays some of your music today. And he says some nice things about you on the radio. Well, I never um, put myself in that class of a player like what Joe and Eric Gills do and all that stuff. And I just thought that I was too old and too stiff for them to appreciate. So I never took it serious. And so after my manager died, he called me again and I took it, I took him serious and I reached out to Joe and I called him. And I know what he had did with Joanna Connor, who's a friend of mine from Chicago. I knew he had already did something with and for her. So I called him, asked him, was there any possibilities that maybe we might could make a record, that he might would make a record on me? And uh, we got started talking, and about almost a couple of years later, it happened. Yeah, and wow, did it happen. Blues Without You is uh, your latest 12-track release, uh, and uh, Joe Bonamassa has uh, placed it on his label, Keeping the Blues Alive, which is exactly right. what he's doing, right? I mean, working with him, that's what he's doing, is keeping the blues alive. He, he's doing a wonderful job. He's, Joe have helped a lot of people, not just me, you know, not just Joe and Connor. I can't even tell you the list of other artists that he have did things for. And then he uh, set up the foundation, which helped a lot of musicians when, uh, you know, everybody's wage kind of just was struck 
right away, long before the government did anything to try to help anybody, yeah. people were still trying to live with no source of income, you know, yeah. so yeah. he helped a lot of people. Yeah. And tell me a little bit about this latest album, because uh, I've had a listen to it and I really love it. It's called Blues Without You. Tell, Give us a bit of the backstory to it. Well, that is dedicated to my manager, the guy I told you about that passed away a year, you know, a year ago. We worked together for over 34 years and we tried to do it. We gave it our best effort and looked like we just couldn't raise the bar. And as soon as he left, you know, that's when opportunities start happening for me. So it's really kind of a bittersweet situation for me. I feel almost as though he was sacrificed so that I could do better. So it's hard to feel good about it sometimes. But when I think about it, you know, I didn't have anything to do with it. And the way he passed, he had a heart attack on the steering wheel. So nobody really had anything to do. But it's just unfortunate that he and I couldn't get the job done, and I, I feel really bad about that. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Despite that, though, your career is surging forward, and you got to be happy about that. So under... Yeah, under, under it's been a long time. I mean, I've been out here, you know, going getting close to 40 years. I'm 62 years old, and to have a 25-year gap you know, in between whether I really couldn't get anything going, it's like starting all over again. Were there times when you wanted to just give it all up and do something else? Almost like starting all over again. Yeah. Were, there, were, there t were there times when you wanted to give it up? Oh, for sure. For for sure. Especially the last, um, the last five or six years. I was looking for an out. I was looking for a way to get out a way to sustain myself because the way I felt about it, I mean, I gave my whole adult life to this. I mean, even before I started playing out uh, nationally, I had been playing music for people since I was 17. Yeah. So, you know, to go that long and to be rejected for that long, you know, small, small accolades. I mean, well, you know about those things, but people in the business, don't always recognize that and they don't really know the importance of those accolades. So it never had any effect on my pay scale. Yeah, yeah. So it so let me know that um, I figured that if Albert King and Albert Collins and B.B. King, which was the greatest blues man of all time in terms of uh, his profile and numbers, if they could only do what they did, who am I to think that things would be any better for me? And and they, all, they also did it in later life, though, didn't they? They weren't really big when they were young men either. No. And and Albert and Albert weren't really making a lot of money before they died either. Yeah. You know, when you compare this music to what other music generates, it's no comparison. It's not even a tenth of what a rock and roll career would be. You know, B.B. was the biggest, and he did good for himself. But look at where he, B.B. only played two and 3,000 seat uh, small theaters in comparison to, you know, other scales of music that play arenas. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's like a mouse and an elephant, you know? Why do you think that is? Well, uh, a lot to do with promotion and uh, lack of... Uh, interest in in the business everybody exploits the music but nobody want to own it and promote it on an equal scale so it only gets promoted when it's convenient for the business so you've got to be really grateful to a person like joe bonamassa who's come along and wants to promote it for the music's sake and right. uh, i mean given the success of this album so far has it changed your life no, ma'am, not yet, but they're telling me that next year is going to be a better year for Larry McRae, so I'm trying to hold on and experience it and see if I can. But but I have to say that uh, some things have changed. I mean, you know, there's been a slight difference in our uh, profile. I'm working for slightly better money. I'm working much better rooms and in better companies. So, you know, there has 
been improvement, just not um, enough to really change my life or change my home home style. You know what I'm saying? Change the way I'm living. Yeah. Well, Larry, you're only 62 years old. <laughs> you're still oh. paying your dues. Another another 20 years, you'll be right up there. <laughs> I guess so. It's just, uh, you know, I look at uh, most of everybody who started out with me and a lot of the bands that started out opening for me a huge mega success. And I just kind of pushed along and stayed where I was at, you know. Everything I, 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 everything in its own sweet time, Larry McRae. It'll happen. I, I, it's already I happening. I sure hope so. I hope you're right. <laughs> and I know we're going to see you visiting this side of the world very soon too. It's going to, it's all happening for you. You make awesome music. And you've certainly paid your dues long and hard, haven't you, to get where you are today. It's only, it's up and up from here. Can't go nowhere but up, huh? That's it. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks so I'm much. Yeah. yeah. Thanks a million for talking to me today, Larry. A real pleasure to meet you. And as I said, we just love your music here. So we'd love to see you over here. Which track should we go out on? Which one is your, is your very favourite special track that you'd like our audience to hear that we haven't already talked about? Uh, I like uh, Down to the Bottom. Tell me a little bit about it. Well, that was inspired by, um, you know, I, I, I was living by myself during the pandemic. And, uh, you know, I, I, I looked around and didn't find much love in my life. And so I thought my thoughts were to have a good love. You got to start from the bottom. You got to start from the ground and build it up. And that was my way of expressing what I felt at the time. Awesome. No love in my life. Well, hopefully you've uh, you've changed that situation now. I got I got love in my life now and I'm really happy happy for that because I spent a lot of time um alone between divorce and to the point that I have the lady that's in my life now. Good. About twelve, thirteen years. That was mm -hmm. long enough. Yeah, we all need love. See how it's all turned around for you. You got love, you got great music, and you got somebody who just wants to take you higher. There you go. See, I, awesome. I'm thankful. Don't think I'm not gratified. At, and I let uh, the people know that every day that I'm thankful for every opportunity and gratified to still be able to play music. You know, I put probably two and a half million miles on in a van, you know, riding around in cramped vehicles and stuff like that and it's it's i'm thankful you know to still be doing what i'm doing yeah yeah we thank you for your music larry mccray great to meet you great to talk to you great to listen to you hope to i see hope you. to see you down on sandy look forward to that all the very best right. thanks for your time right. today bye now thank you thank bye. you bye, bye. bye.